Okay, we're going to move into chapter five, talking a little bit more about amino acids, but we're going to string them together in what's known as polypeptides. Uh, we're going to talk about analyzing them, purifying them, sequencing, and evolution. So here are the sections that we'll talk about, and we'll start with polypeptide diversity, and like I said, purification analysis. Uh, we'll split this up into two lectures. The next one will be protein sequencing and then protein evolution. So for our key concepts in theory, the size and composition of a polypeptide chain are unlimited. So we could string together amino acids forever. However, in cells, uh, we see that the variety is limited by the efficiency of protein synthesis and by the ability of the polypeptide to fold up into a functional structure. Now I've got a picture here of the Hubble Ultra Deep Field picture. If you don't know what that is, uh, go look it up. It's really interesting. Essentially, they put the Hubble Space Telescope to the darkest spot of the sky, took pictures for a year or two, I believe, and this is what they found. That really doesn't have anything to do with this lecture other than the estimated number of atoms in the universe, if you consider all the matter out there and counted up all the atoms, it'd be somewhere around one times 10 to the 80th. I'll just keep that number in the back of your mind for a second. So when we look at peptides, like we said, you could string together the amino acids for a long time, for you know, have hundreds, thousands, millions of these amino acids linked together. But we want to ask the question, well, in, pro in humans, how many proteins are there? And it depends on how you count, but somewhere between 20 and 80,000. There are uh, about 20,000 genes that make proteins, but uh, it's a little bit more complicated. Just understand that you know, there is a finite amount of types of proteins in humans. But the question is, how many are possible? That's really the question that we would want to answer. So we'll throw a little bit of statistics at you. So when we have n units, uh, the total number, if our library is 20, equals 20 to the n. So if we take 20 and we say, okay, I'm going to put a 100 residues or 100 amino acids in a protein, take 20, raise it to the power of 100, and the answer is 1.3 times 10 to the 130th different combinations. Now, if you remember, the number of atoms in the universe is about 1 times 10 to the 80th. So just for 100 residues, 100 amino acids, with our library of 20 different amino acids, there are more proteins possible than there are atoms in the universe. So how I put that is there's no possible way to make all possible one, all possible 100 amino acid proteins. Just kind of sad to me. That's why I got the sad emoji there. We're never going to be able to make all the possible 100 amino acid proteins. There's just not enough atoms in the universe. In fact, if we lower it down to just 51 amino acids, uh, there is an interesting functional protein known as insulin. We've got its sequence shown down there, it's bovine insulin. You can actually see which amino acids are hooked to which. You can see where the disulfide bonds are, and you can actually see that there's actually two different chains here, chain A and chain B, and those chains are actually linked together uh, by disulfide bonds. And there's 51 residues total in this bovine insulin. So if we tried to make all 51 residue proteins, that would give us 2.3 times 10 to 66 different combinations. And again, the likelihood of being able to make that is really not going to happen. So what we need to understand from all this is the protein landscape, all possible proteins will never be made. And in fact, only a few, a handful, even less than a handful relative to the possible number, humans actually use 
uh, to do work or are functional in the human body or, or even found in organisms. So, in and to summarize that, there's almost an infinite number of possibilities of proteins, but in reality, there's very few that are biologically significant. So most proteins are made of chains between 100 to, uh, to 1,000 residues. 40 is about the minimum for a functional protein. And we just kind of want to think about the reasons for the upper and lower limits. For the lower limits, we'll probably answer more of that in the next chapter. But if we don't have too many residues, there's going to be lots of flexibility there. And so it's not really going to fold up into a defined structure. And we'll find out that proteins uh, do their job by having a very defined three-dimensional structure. There is some flexibility there, but overall it's the, the three-dimensional nature and placement of functional groups that allows proteins to, to do what they do. So if you get less than 40, you start getting a floppy protein that really can't fold up. If you get over a thousand residues, it's going to be really hard to make sure that you actually get those in the proper places. But of course, there are always exceptions. And so we've got a little table here that you can look at the number of residues. Uh, sometimes more than one protein will associate. So the actual protein may have what we refer to as multiple subunits. Again, we'll talk about that more next chapter, but you can see here that uh, the largest single subunit uh, protein is actually Titan, which is a protein that helps uh, organize muscle structure. And it's got 34,350 amino acids in there with an amazing molecular weight of 3.8 million Daltons. So huge, huge. So anyway, that's an unusual protein. So you can see there's lots of varied uh, variety. So we don't want to give two hard and fast rules because nature finds a way to exclude those rules. So just knowing the number and type of amino acids in a protein is not sufficient. It has a lot to do with how those amino acids are strung together, going from the N-terminus to the C-terminus. What is the sequence there? So we can see the average occurrence of amino acids, but if you just decided to throw those percentages together and hope that you'd get a functional protein, the chance is very small that you'd get a functional protein. So we need a very defined structure in there. Just kind of interesting to look at this and see which amino acids are used frequently and which ones aren't. Okay, and so that's really it out of uh, section one. Just understand that we can get a lot of diversity in our proteins due to the 20 amino acids and the ability to string them together in polymers of different sequences. Okay, so we're gonna talk a lot more in this next section about protein purification and analysis. So there's a lot more detail here that we need to go into, uh, but common questions that we have about peptides and proteins are what's its sequence? What's its composition? What are the amino acids and where are they located? As I mentioned earlier, these proteins tend to fold up into three dimensions and those three dimensions are very important for its function. And so how does the protein actually find these folds? Uh, how does it achieve its biochemical role, whatever it be, if it's structural or catalytic? Uh, how is its function regulated? So we make sure that it does its job and doesn't do its job too well or too poorly. Uh, how does it interact with other macromolecules? Cells are actually pretty concentrated with a bunch of molecules. So what does it interact with? And uh, how's it related to other proteins? Where did it come from evolutionarily? And uh, where do we find it in cells? And what are its properties? So to answer all these questions and other questions that you come up with, we actually need a pure sample of the protein. And so the question is, how do we do that? Well, we can separate the protein based on its physiochemical properties. 
So what are some of these properties that we can take advantage of? Well, the overall charge on the protein, the protein size, if it has an affinity for some other molecule, its solubility, its hydrophobicity, its thermal stability. And so typically, if you're just gonna isolate a protein out of a cell, any given protein would make up at most 0.1% of a cell's dry weight. So if you're just gonna take cells and try to isolate a protein, there's not much there. So either way, uh, well, so in order to do that, you need to find a way to purify that. So what you can do is find a protein that makes up a larger mass of some tissues, such as hemoglobin or myoglobin, uh, find a way to get a lot of that. So hemoglobin comes from blood. So if you can find a, blood, a, a bunch of blood, so if you know the colons, they could go out and collect the blood for you. Or slaughterhouses will collect the blood and then you can isolate the protein from there. Or choose the version of proteins that's made by an easily cultivated organism, such as a bacteria or yeast or cows. And what we mean by cows, if you, there's a specific protein in the heart. Cows tend to have big hearts and we slaughter a lot of them. So you just collect the hearts and purify it from there. Or what you can do is take advantage of DNA technology and put the gene into a plasmid or some other vector and have some organism do the work for you, such as E. coli or yeast. And then what you do is you have a strong promoter that makes a lot of that protein. So you have the E. coli act as little factories and, and spit out a lot of that protein. So that's, that's how they do a lot of it. Uh, or what you do is you tag your protein. We'll talk about that, but you could have a very small amount of the protein in there, but if you tag it and you can specifically grab that tag, then even though there's a very small amount in there, you can actually purify it. So we're gonna talk about these ways to purify. Now the problem is each protein's unique. So even though there's some commonalities there, it won't share all its properties with other proteins. So essentially you have to trial and error if you want to purify a new protein. And it usually involves several different techniques. So not like organic chemistry where we can just get a pure compound by let's say a recrystallization or a distillation or an extraction. If we liken this to organic chemistry, then you'd often have to do a distillation and then a vacuum distillation and an extraction and a recrystallization and a chromatography step. So you'll find out that in purifying proteins, you have to do multiple steps. So, but the thing is, is different techniques, depending on what you want to do with your protein, require different purities. So when it's pure enough, that actually depends on what you're planning to do with the protein. Now, there's another added disadvantage in working with proteins over just organic molecules is that proteins were evolved to be stable under a particular set of conditions. So typically physiological conditions, or at least wherever that uh, protein's found, it tends to be the most stable there. So the environment in cells is crowded, it's buffered, it's salty, it has a constant temperature. There's chaperones that we'll talk about later that help to refold unstable proteins. And so proteins tend to be uh, less stable when you remove them from the cells. And uh, so what you need to do is watch those conditions. So keep the pH generally close to neutral. Uh, temperature often denature, we'll talk about that a little bit later, but lose their shape uh, as we get higher temperatures. So you do this at low temperatures, four degrees Celsius is common. You don't necessarily want to do it at zero because then the water starts to freeze and that can cause issues. Uh, salt concentration is going to affect it, so you need to worry about how much salt you have around. There are enzymes, other proteins that eat other proteins or chew them up. So when you start purifying, you got to be careful that your protein of interest isn't getting degraded or digested by another protein. And so you want to maximize a concentration, but minimize foaming. If you get foaming at the air bubble interface, you may get denaturation and lose the structure of your protein. So the take home message from this is in purifying a protein, there's lots of things to be concerned about. So like it says there in purple at the end, the best method needs to be determined empirically, meaning experimentally. You need to run into the lab and actually figure out what's the best way to do this.
Okay, lots of words. We'll get to some pictures here soon, but uh, there's some general steps that you need to undertake when purifying a protein. First, you got to get it out of the cell, so you lyse the cell. There's a couple different ways that you can do that. Again, you want to be somewhat careful because if you use too much mechanical energy, you can actually denature your protein. So one way to do it a little bit gently is freeze thaw the cells. So as ice crystals form, they'll help break up the membranes. This is one reason that cryogenically preserving yourself so that at some date in the future they could reanimate you doesn't necessarily work because if you get frozen, all those ice crystals essentially just decimate your cells, shred the cells your cells. So you can crush or grind frozen tissue. Uh, you can disrupt it by high pressure. There's a, uh, an inst well, yeah, instrument, so known as a French press. You just kind of squeeze it through there and it'll break apart the cells. You sonicate it, use sound energy, and that will break the cell membranes and release the proteins from uh, into solution. Vortex, you just mix it at high speed with glass beads. So you're kind of uh, beating it up with these glass beads, break open the cell, or you use enzymes that uh, break down the cell wall. So step one, take home message. You gotta break apart the cell to get the protein out. Uh, then there's gonna be a lot of junk that you don't want to deal with. And hopefully your protein's soluble. If it's insoluble, that leads to a whole bunch of other problems. But when you do this, you'll be left with just a bunch of insoluble stuff. And so you can centrifuge that or filter it off and separate it. And then what you want to do is fractionate the soluble stuff, uh, which includes a bunch of different proteins. And what we mean by fractionate is separate into different fractions. And we're going to spend a lot of time talking about that. Uh, so the step three is really important. And there's many different ways to actually separate or purify but then you need some way to assay to find your protein of interest in the fractions. Uh, so you need to actually figure out, do I have the protein of interest and does it do what it's expected to do? And then once you do that, you pool the fractions because often you've collected several different aliquots of this and you put those together. And then you may repeat step three, four, and five many times to get the protein up to your desired pure, uh, purity. So this little picture over here is an E. coli, and sometimes when you make them make a bunch of protein, they can't necessarily deal with it, so they pack it all together in what's known as an inclusion body. And sometimes that can be advantageous, uh, so essentially you've got these little inclusion bodies that have essentially your pure protein in. So if, if you can get these inclusion bodies out, that's uh, a quick way to get a head start on purification. The issue is often they're not folded properly. So the cell's making so much of this protein, it can't fold it properly. And so it just packs it into these inclusion bodies. But uh, and again, there's ways around that, but that's uh, just something that happens when you try to get an organism to overexpress a protein. So like I said, or mentioned on the previous slide is we're gonna talk about assaying first because that's probably most important. You could purify something, but if it's not what you wanted, you just wasted a lot of time. So you need something to test as you go through the purification to make sure that you're isolating your desired protein. And so these are just referred to as assays or tests, and it determines whether the protein of interest is present. And there's a bunch of different types of assays. In fact, if you go over to the library, you can find books and books, depending on which protein you're trying to to isolate. So here's an example one. So an assay for the enzyme uh, lactate dehydrogenase. If that was the protein of interest and we knew that it turned lactate into pyruvate, we could actually take advantage of this. And what we'd do is we'd throw some lactate and some NAD plus in solution. And if we had our protein of interest, the lactate dehydrogenase, it would make pyruvate and NADH which you can actually use uh, or identify spectral photometrically. So like UV vis, and we'll talk more about that, but what you do is you make sure that this enzyme's producing the NADH, and that gives you a hint that you've got the right protein. But any purification scheme is measured by calculating the specific activity after each separation technique. And what we mean by that is making sure that the enzyme 
or the protein is doing what we expect it to do and measuring the rate at which it does that. So activity units are defined in different ways for different enzymes, but uh, one way of thinking of it is, you know, how many micromoles of substrate is consumed, you know, starting material is consumed, or how much product is produced per minute. That's a common way to look at its activity. And that's just the activity of the sample, but you want to correlate that to how much protein is in there. And so, uh, when you relate the activity to the amount of protein in there, that's referred to as a specific activity. We will talk about that in a little bit later too, but in the end, understand that assay methods vary, but they typically require detecting a substrate disappearing or a product forming over time to make sure that you're uh, purifying the protein of interest. Okay. And this can be a very specific way to see if you have your protein of interest in there because proteins are often specific for a given reaction. So here is just another example. Look at the rate of a catalyzed reaction. So we're looking at an enzyme that oxidizes carbon monoxide and will make carbon dioxide. And so it takes carbon monoxide plus water and produces carbon dioxide. And in this process, it produces some um, hydronium ions, H plus, and some electrons. Well, you can take advantage of the fact that it produces the electrons and have a second or a coupled reaction. So there's a dye known as methyl viologen that in its oxidized force form is essentially colorless. And when it gains an electron, so gain electrons, you're reduced, it becomes blue. And so as the top reaction here produces electrons, this bottom reaction here will capture those electrons and start to turn blue. So if you have a lot of this enzyme in there and you have this methyl biologen sitting around, then the solution should turn blue and you can check that rate. And so here is the absorbance over time. And so you can see that it changes. And so if you pick a specific absorbent, so this one right here is picking this peak about 630 and plotting the absorbance, how intense that peak is versus time. And so if you have a really active enzyme, the more time you give it, the greater that absorbance should be. If you happen to have a enzyme that for some reason, maybe it's not as pure as you think, or it's not at its optimal pH, or it just mis is misfolded, then you're not gonna get nearly the activity that you would out of the pure enzyme. So this could hint that, okay, you need to purify it more. And this is the worst result right here. Nothing's happening. So either you purified the wrong protein or you denatured it or it got chewed up, but uh, this is a sign of start over. It doesn't look like there's anything in there doing what you want it to do. So these assay methods are really key. Again, in organic chemistry, we can purify a compound and run in and take an NMR. That's gonna be a lot harder for a large molecule like a protein. So you want to see if it's there by looking at its function. There's other ways. Uh, this is known as an enzyme-linked immunosorbent, immunosorbent assay right here. And so it requires antibodies that bind the protein of interest. So let's say that your protein actually doesn't have a catalytic function, but it has a structure that you're interested in. And so you have an antibody, which is actually just another protein that specifically interacts with your, your protein of interest. So you can see that this would be a lot more complex because you'd actually need an antibody that specifically interacts with your protein of interest. But this is doable and right, we won't get into the weeds on it, but it's a doable. Let's just say that we have a protein that we know binds our protein of interest. And what we do is we fix it to a solid support. And then we wash over our molecule that we are purifying. And the more of that molecule, the more of these binding spots that will be taken up. Okay. Once you get your uh, protein of interest bound, what you do is you have a second antibody that recognizes a different part of that protein. 
And so this is what they refer to as the enzyme linked because this is not just an antibody, it has another enzyme that does a catalytic uh, activity. So it'll turn over some substrate. So again, this is more complex because you need a protein that you've got essentially two antibodies to. But if you have that protein here and this antibody binds it, then what you do is you throw in the substrate of interest and now this antibody will turn that over and you'll get some indication like we saw before, either an increase in absorbance or some chemical reaction. And that lets you know that you have this protein of interest. Now you can imagine if I had a different molecule here and let's make it a square. Well, that square is not going to bind here. So imagine that all these spots are now open. So now we go down to this one and we throw in this antibody. Again, imagine that these spots are open. Well, that antibody is not going to have anything to bind to. And so what happens is you throw in your second antibody. Those are super expensive because they're antibodies that have enzymes on them. And then what you do is you wash it away and only those that are bound will react. So if you didn't have the right protein here, you'd wash away all that expensive antibody, you'd throw in the substrate, no reaction would occur, and then you'd be really, really sad because you'd realize you didn't have that protein of interest. So these types of assays are actually used very frequently. In fact, if you've ever had a pregnancy test or you go and take some of the, some drug tests, uh, they, they actually use these assays very frequently. So anyway, very powerful. But those assays are expensive because you have to have antibodies. So like I said, one of the ways to do it is just by absorbance of a reaction and actually to see if you're producing a product. There's another way if you're living righteously and you're pretty sure that you got the right protein uh, maybe using some other information, what you can do is you can actually just take a UV vis of it and actually figure out how much is there. Now, the danger in here is most proteins will absorb in the ultraviolet uh, region here, and they absorb due to the aromatic residues such as tryptophan, tyrosine, and phenylalanine. But uh, so, so there's so you could kind of hope that you've got the right protein, or if you purified the protein and you want to figure out how much is there, then you can use this uh, UV vis absorption and use the Beer Lambert law, which you should have talked a lot about in gen chemist general chemistry. And essentially, general chemistry, uh, the Beer Lambert law will actually you can figure out concentration from there using the formula up here. So this is absorbance. This is the light. Uh, how much light you are putting into the sample. This is actually how much is transmitted. And that is related to the molar absorptivity, which is essentially how much that molecule absorbs of the light. Here's the concentration and here's the path length. And so if you know this molar absorptivity constant here, you can actually figure out concentration here. So if I know this and the path length and I determine absorbance, I can actually determine concentration here. Okay, so this is a way to determine concentration of a protein. But again, you want to make sure that it's pure before you do this. Okay, we'll just skip over that. That's redundant. So that is the first thing that you want to sort out before you start purifying because you want to make sure that as you purify, you are purifying your protein of interest. So how do we purify proteins? Well, we take advantage of their physiochemical properties, and some of those properties include solubility, ionic charge, polarity, the size of the protein, and if that protein happens to bind something specifically. So that's gonna be what we talk about most in the next little bit. But before we get into that, we just need to talk about the protein sol solubility uh, and salt slash pH. So proteins tend to be least soluble at their isoelectric points. Now, when they're isoelectric, that doesn't mean that they're not charged. They just have an equal number of positive and negative charges. So they tend to be more soluble if they have an, a 
excess of positive charges or an excess of negative charges. When you get to that neutral point, you've kind of minimized the number of charges on that protein and they tend to be uh, the least soluble. And in fact, they'll have a lot of attraction for other proteins in there. Now, if we change the pH too much, the structure of the protein will change. And again, we'll talk more about that in, in the next chapter. So we need to watch our pH as we do this. Now, if we go from a low to a moderate ionic strength, meaning we start to add salt, it tends to solubilize the protons, or sorry, the proteins. And what it does is it diminishes the electrostatic interactions between protein molecules. And so what you're kind of doing is creating an ionic shell, for lack of a better visualization, around the protein. And that ionic shell is going to help that individual protein stay soluble in water. But if we start increasing the ionic strength too much, then the proteins tend to precipitate. And these are, uh, the reasons for that are kind of complicated and it actually depends on the ions that you use. So we're not gonna get too much in the weeds there, just understand that as we start increasing the salt concentrations, proteins tend to become more soluble, but if we start increasing it too much, then the protein can actually crash out of solution. And we can take advantage of that. And in fact, here is a little graph. So notice here's the salt, so, and here's the solubility. So what we do is we increase the salt concentration and we get a maximum solubility here. Now, if we had other proteins in there, let's draw them as red dots, they're gonna have a different graph. So their solubility is going to be different. And so what happens is we increase the salt concentration for these red proteins, they're going to start precipitating out before our purple dots there. So our purple dots tend to be more soluble in a higher salt concentration. And so what we do is we increase the salt concentration, stuff falls out and we filter out our red particles. So these are now gone. And then we keep adding salt in there and then eventually the proteins will start aggregating and then they'll precipitate out. Now the advantage here is that we've separated out the red proteins because they have a different solubility profile in salt than our desired purple proteins there. And a lot of this depends on the type of salt that you use and you can see the log of the solubility. So we're doing this on a logarithmic scale and the amount of salt that you add actually depends on the type of salt that you're using. This is known as the Hofmeister series and we're not going to talk too much about it. But essentially these ions here have kind of different effects on surface tension and protein stability and solubility and protein denaturation. So you can use these different salts and Again, you've got to determine this experimentally, but you play around with it to kind of maximize your protein solubility and the impurities will hopefully be insoluble and precipitate out. So this is what's referred to as salting in and salting out a protein. And so here's an example here. So you keep the solution cold because you don't want it to denature and you start adding in the salt. So in this case, our target protein is the green one. So as we start adding salt, the red uh, tends to precipitate out at lower salt concentrations and our green stays in solution. Then we add more and more salt and eventually our green precipitates out and you notice that the orange are still in solution. And so at step C right there, what we can do is pour off the top decant centrifuge or whatever and collect this amount, the green proteins. Now it'd be nice if it was this easy and clean, but that's the general idea. And so you could imagine if I wanted the red protein, then I'd wanna separate it at this point. Or you could even take advantage of this. Here I precipitated out all the other proteins and then I take this solution of the orange proteins and then I'd have to have, find some way to concentrate it. But in this example shown here, you could actually 
purify all three of those proteins by this salting in and salting out process. It just depends on which step you remove the sample. Okay, so we're going to talk about what's known as chromatography here. And chromatography, we did a little bit of this in organic chemistry, but it is the separation based on the movement of a liquid phase through a stationary phase. So the liquid phase is what's referred to as the mobile phase. The stationary phase is some solid that actually doesn't move. And so the mobile phase is percolated or pumped or forced through a tube containing a porous solid matrix. And what we mean by that is you can't just have a solid piece of something in there. It has to have holes and a way for the liquid to move around and through that stationary phase. And I'll show you some pictures here in just a second. And how this works is some solutes in the mobile phase interact more strongly with the stationary phase. And so they tend to be retained on the column. Your book talks about being retarded in their movement. I never liked that word, but uh, they tend to be retained or uh, held up on the column. If the column's long enough, then what happens is essentially you can race them down this column. Those that stick more stay on longer and those that don't stick come out. So chromatography, there's a bunch of different types and the techniques are usually classified according to the nature of the interaction between the solutes and the stationary phase. So let's look at some examples of chromatography. Okay, so nice pictures here. So different molecules interact differently with solid, with the solid and mobile phases. And so what we've got here is the stationary phase, it's packed into a tube and you've added your sample mixture right here. You've got some type of liquid here. You can often start with a low salt and uh, you can change pHs and all sorts of things up here to help to get the proteins to move. But as you add in this liquid, there's gonna be liquid that moves out the bottom. And so this mixture here is gonna be dragged through the stationary phase. Now, some things have greater affinity for that stationary phase than others. So in this case here, the yellow has a really high affinity for the stationary phase, the green, not so much. And this red really doesn't have any affinity at all. It just kind of ran right off. And so you separate it out. Sometimes things get stuck on there because they have so much affinity. So if you change the eluent or the solvent that you're running through there, or what's also known as the mobile phase, then you can start to get them to have less interaction with the stationary phase and more interaction with the mobile phase. And so you can see as we change the buffer, then we actually get the green to come out and then we can actually get the red. Now you don't wanna just collect this all in one beaker, that would be dumb because you'd just be moving it from one place into a new beaker. So you fractionate it, you collect different fractions here. So here they're showing you test tubes. So you just have a bunch of test tubes and you collect you know, two to three milliliters in each test tube. And then what you do is you'll assay each one of those samples and figure out where your protein of interest is. And so you can use like UV Viz to actually tell you how much protein is in there, but it won't tell you the one that you want. So let's say that we did this and we see that uh, this is our absorbance of our different samples. And then what we'd do is we'd assay each one of these groups. And let's say that the green one does the reaction that we're interested in. Then we know that, oh, we're gonna keep those fractions that have this activity that we're interested in and you pool all those together. Okay, so that is one way to separate based on uh, chromatography, it's affinity for that solid phase there. So here's just another example of it. Okay, now here's another picture of it. And so you can actually automate this. 
So what you do is you place your sample on the column and then you have a pump and the pump will have a reservoir that it pulls the liquid from and you'll pump that liquid through and then what you do is you'll collect the liquid out here and often you'll have a detector of some sort and that detector is often just a UV vis uh, that will actually just detect the presence of protein and so when the protein starts to come out it will collect it and then it will collect you know a certain amount each time and then again you'll have to assay each fraction and then you pool those so this is how column chromatography works both in organic chemistry and in uh, biochemistry now in biochemistry they tend to use different types of solid for uh, stationary phases so we need to talk about some of the different stationary phases that they have so some of the solid phases or stationary phases include cellulose, agarose, dextrin. Those are all just carbohydrate polymers. Silica, which is sand. Polyacrylamide, and that polyacrylamide can have various groups. Uh, you can have active groups on the chromatography, such as cations or anions or hydrophobic groups of various sizes, and we'll talk about that. Or they may have metal binding groups. Now the mobile phase depends on the active groups on the uh, solid phase. So the liquid that you're using actually depends on uh, the type of solid phase and what groups are on there. And so there's a bunch of different ways that you can do this. You can do this in thin layer chromatography. So just kind of a plate that has a thin layer of the solid absorbent on it. The simplest example of this is just a piece of filter paper. That's how they began doing chromatography with proteins or amino acids with just a piece of filter paper. Uh, open columns, closed columns where you actually put pressure on there. Uh, columns with extremely fine solid phases and you use high pressures. And you can have various degrees of automation in there. But let's talk about some of the phases that you could have. So you could have just cellulose or you could modify that cellulose with a amine group and so this is what's known as a cat or sorry uh, this is an anion exchange column and the reason for that is this has anions that associate with the cation group on there so what we're going to do is run our protein through and we're going to exchange anions there and so the protein is loaded in a buffer with low salt. Uh, and what's going to happen is negatively charged proteins. So let me draw a good picture of a negatively charged protein. So let's say that it has a bunch of glutamic acids on there or aspartic acids. And so it's going to be negatively charged. And it's going to have an attraction for that positive charge on the solid support. And then what you do is you'd increase the salt concentration, the mobile phase, and increase, let's just say, the chloride. And then what happens is your protein and that chloride are going to compete for the cation there. And so, again, the reason it's called an anion exchange is because you're exchanging out the anion. And so as you change the chloride or add the chloride, then it will release your protein, and eventually your protein will elute out. So one way that this works is the weakest binding proteins will elute first because they don't have a lot of attraction for that positive. And so you can uh, essentially select for the protein that is very, as a surface or lots of negatively charges. Now we don't want to just do anion exchange. We could actually do cation exchange. Here's another anion exchange. Uh, but we could do a cation exchange. And so in the case of a cation exchange, oh, I thought I had a picture, but it went somewhere. But the cation exchange, what you'd have is negative groups here. And then, of course, you would have a counter ion. And then as you run your protein through, so let's run our protein through. And let's say that it is, has an overall positive charge, it's going to be attracted and exchanged for that sodium ion. And then after a while, and you do this, you start increasing the sodium concentration. 
and then the sodium wins out for the attraction for the negative charge and your protein will be released. And again, the weakest binding proteins will loop first. So this is what's known as anion exchange and cation exchange chromatography. Uh, yeah, there's just another example of an anionic uh, group, this uh, sulfonate right there. Okay. And here is just an example. So let's figure out if this is a cation exchange or an anion exchange. So you can see the resin there. And the resin is overall negative charge and it's always going to have that charge. So what that means is that the counter ion that we're gonna have hanging out with that resin is going to be a positive. So this is what we would refer to as a cation exchange. We're gonna exchange out the sodium and as we start flushing our protein through there, it's going to displace and exchange for that sodium there. And again, you have to change your eluent or the solvent that you run through. So at first you'll have low sodium concentration, so the protein will stick, and then you start increasing the sodium concentration. And again, the proteins that have the greatest positive charge will stick to the resin the most, and you can separate them out. And so you can see the ones that stick the most here are the large net positive. So lots of attraction for the re resin. Those that essentially just fly through are going to be those that have a net negative charge. In fact, they'll be repelled from the resin and just really run through really quick. And so you can see that you can separate them based on uh, the protein's overall charge. And again, we can change a protein's charge by the pH, but we've got to be careful when we change the pH because you can change the, the actual structure of the protein. So uh, like we talked about, proteins are least soluble at their isoelectric point. And that isoelectric point really depends on the type of protein. And so you can see a wide range from less than one for an isoelectric point for pepsin to salmine. I have no idea what that does, but uh, it's got a PI of 12.1. So recall how protein charge changes with pH. So below its PI, it tends to have a net positively charged. So if I knew the PI of the protein and I put the pH below that, it would have a positive charge. And then I could use a uh, cation exchange resin. If it was above the PI, then it'd have a net negative charge and I could use an anion exchange there. So anyway, we can play with the pH and again, use this cation and anion exchange to purify proteins. Uh, one thing that we need to talk about is how do you actually determine an isoelectric point if you can't just add up the residues. So with large proteins, you really have to deter determine it experimentally. And so what you do is you have a strip as it's shown here in yellow and the pH varies across that strip here. So pH nine and a pH of three. And what you do is you essentially just kind of plot your protein in the middle there and you have a negative charge and a positive charge to the strip. And then what happens is the negatively charged proteins are going to move this direction. Positively charged proteins are gonna move that direction. But when they become electrically neutral, so again, the pH varies. So when the PI equals the pH, and so in this case here, let's say that the PI for that protein was around eight. When it reaches that pH at eight, it's gonna have an overall neutral charge. And so it no longer is going to have an attraction to the left or the right, or what you could say is it has equal attraction to the left and the right, and it stops there. So you can put proteins on this strip. You run the strip and you can figure out what the PI is. And this is known as isoelectric focusing and because you actually focus that protein into this very concentrated spot. So like I said, because if it starts to, if we go this direction, it's gonna become more negative. And so it would be drawn back towards the positive pole. If it moved this direction, 
we're increasing the pH should become more positive and then it would be dragged towards that negative pole. And so it just happens to find that happy medium where its overall charge is zero, its isoelectric point. So that's how we can determine that. We're gonna see that a little bit later, but uh, yeah, we can take advantage of those isoelectric points and use it in purifying proteins. The other thing that we can do is take advantage of the hydrophobic parts of the protein and separate. And so we can have a solid support, and that's just all this is, it's just some type of solid support. And then what you can do is modify that solid support with different hydrophobic groups. And so in this case here, what you're doing is you're hoping that the protein's hydrophobic regions will interact with these hydrophobic portions. And the stronger those interactions, the less likely the protein is to elute. And again, you can change the pH, you change the charge, and then the protein will separate out there. Okay, so you can use essentially the hydrophobic uh, effect as a solid support. One other way is you can use this gel filtration or also known as size exclusion chromatography. And in here, what you have are beads and these beads actually have little, a network in them, pores, you could say. And those pores tend to be fairly small. Actually, you can get them of all different sizes and you have what's called the exclusion cutoff. And what that means are how big are those pores? So if you are above the exclusion cutoff, then you don't interact with that bead at all. If you're under that exclusion size, what happens is you tend to get trapped in those pores. And so you can see here, the blue dots are being excluded from this bead where the red dots can actually make it into those pores and get trapped. So if you think about it, the red ones end up getting trapped in this network where the big ones uh, tend to be excluded and just bypass the beads. So what you can do is separate based on size here. The big ones tend to come off first and then the small ones have a lot longer journey because they kept, keep getting stuck in the pores of the beads and so they can separate this. And, and so you can get size exclusion, uh, or yeah, size exclusion media of a bunch of different sizes to separate out your, your proteins based on size. Here's just another example showing you that the small molecules tend to get stuck in the pores and the larger molecules are excluded and tend to travel faster. So large molecules elute off first here. Now we're talking about a bunch of different methods, but what I want you to understand is that in order to get a pure protein, you often have to employ many different methods. And so we have another one, and that is, again, we've got a stationary phase. That's common for all of chromatography. Really what's varying is what is on there. So you can actually attach molecules that the proteins have an affinity for. So in this picture here, we've got little black dots, and that is some ligand or some molecule that the red protein likes to attach to, where you can see that the blue and the green proteins don't have any affinity for it. So as you place this on the column, the red ones have some type of affinity. Now you don't want them to have too high of affinity or they'll just stick right up there at the top and you'll never get them off. So they need to kind of have an intermediate affinity, but you can imagine that they make and break bonds to whatever that ligand is, not covalent bonds, but intermolecular interactions. And so they will kind of be retained here and move slower than the other molecules that have no affinity for whatever that molecule is. And I'm gonna give you an example of that in just a second, a specific example here. Here's just another picture. You can see that the gray is the solid support, the red dot is the ligand, and the green is the protein that actually has a, an affinity for that ligand. And the purple and orange dots have no affinity, so they are just immediately washed out. And then uh, what you do is you can, like I said, if the affinity is not too big, then the protein will make and break that interaction and actually be washed off. Or what you can do is challenge the protein with the ligand or the reagent in solution. So what you do is 
these red dots are both attached to the resin and in solution. And so now as I start to pump it through, the proteins will let go of the resin and actually bind to the, uh, the ligand or the molecule in solution. And now you can see here, instead of being bound to the resin, it's just bound to that molecule and it will come off. So there's a couple of different ways that you can use that affinity. Uh, but uh, the example that I'm gonna show you right now is a very common one. And that is the histidine uh, side chain has a very strong interaction for nickel. And so over here is an example of our solid support. And what you have is just some spacer and then you've got this NTA, which is nickel triacetic acid, I believe. Nickel NTA or nitrogen triacetic acid. Maybe that. Ooh. There we go. We need a bonus for this. Tell me what the NTA, I'm pretty sure TA stands for try acetic acid, but uh, what does the N stand for? Send that to me in an email and you'll get your plus one points. And that will let me know that you're listening. So this ligand right here, it's got carboxylic acids and it really bind, uh, tightly binds nickel, has a really high affinity. And then if you have several histidines close by each other, it will actually have an interaction with that nickel right there. And so uh, typically what they do is they put what's known as a his tag, six to 10 histidines in a sequence, and that will bind to this nickel here with really high affinity. And even those molecules that have a couple histidines won't bind nearly as tightly as the this his tag. And so this is stuck to the column. And then what you need to do is get rid of uh, the nickel. So either you can strip the nickel away or you add nickel in solution, and then this will come over and bind. So either way, you've got to break that attraction between the protein, which is this yellow sphere, and the nickel that's bound to the solid phase there. So the columns wash with an increasing concentration of imidazole. And so that's one way to do it. Uh, so the imidazole will, imidazole is actually just this molecule without the carboxylic acid. So the imidazole will come in and bind and then the histidines can't, attack, uh, can't interact with the nickel there. Okay. And so you can actually use all sorts of tags can be added to proteins. Uh, so you often do this by engineering the gene. And so you can have tags that are recognized by specific antibodies, and then those antibodies are bound to the column. And so, again, they would help retain the protein. His tags we just talked about. Uh, fluorescent tags. So if you actually put the green fluorescent protein in your, uh, and added that to your protein of interest, then you could actually shine it uh, black light on it and actually see where your protein is at on a column. And then there's other protein tags. The whole point to understand these affinity tags is that you have some affinity between the protein and the solid support. And it's a reversible affinity so you can get your protein to be released. Okay, we're gonna wind this up really quick. We're just gonna talk a little bit more about electrophoresis. We talked about it in DNA, uh, but you can use it in proteins. Uh, you typically use polyacrylamide gel in here. And again, you add the samples and you can see it, we're adding it to the sample wells here. You have a positive end and a negative end and you just add current through there. Again, you're gonna wanna make sure that you've got the right pH so that the molecule has a slight negative charge and will be attracted to that positive there. Uh, you also get the buffer that helps move through here and helps drag the sample through. And so the gel matrix hinders mobility of proteins according to their size. And so now this is different than size exclusion. So the gel will actually uh, hinder all proteins. The small ones tend to get through quicker in electrophoresis where they tend to be retained in size exclusion. In size exclusion, remember they get caught up in the beads, the small molecules do. 
here, the small ones are being attracted by charge and can actually navigate their way through quicker here. So everyone's interacting here. The small ones just get through quicker. Okay, so this is called polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis, also known as PAGE. And so here's an example. And so this is actually a purification using a nickel NTA column. And so what you have here, I believe, is uh, the sample before you loaded it on the column. And you can see that this protein has been overexpressed. And that's the one that is of interest. This is the flow through. So this is what came through. And you notice that, yeah, we don't have much of that protein anymore. And then I don't know what W stands for. It may be the wild type that didn't have the protein expressed at a higher level. But in the end, what you can see is in the first fraction, you really didn't collect anything. And uh, there were some slight, you know, there's a little bit of protein here and a little bit of protein here. And then as you started adding the imidazole, you would release your protein that had this his tag. And then in the second, you've got a lot more and a lot more and a lot more. And then you notice here, you're starting to get really pure protein. The bad part is you're getting very small amounts of it. So it's not perfect. You know, this, you got some contaminants in there, but uh, you've increased the purity from this expression here to 85% just using this nickel NTA column. And then you could use another method to increase the purity even more. So what's happening are these proteins here likely have some histidine that are in close proximity that are also binding to this column there. And this is just a from different suppliers showing that, hey, thermal scientific actually gives you higher purification than quiagen. Anyway, so that's why there's two different ones here, just showing one's more efficient or you know, you're capturing more protein on there. Okay, now we can use electrophoresis uh, with an added detergent, sodium dodecyl sulfate. And so here's a structure of sodium dodecyl sulfate. It will bind to proteins and actually it will cause it to unfold. And then what it does is it actually interacts with the proteins and gives the proteins a uniform negative charge. And since the protein is now going to have this negative, the uh, uniform negative charge, the native shape of the protein doesn't really matter. Really, the rate of movement will only depend on the size. And again, the small proteins will move faster. So here's just an idealized SDS page. So sodium dodecyl sulfate polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis. So a really uh, big protein is not going to move as fast. And you can see the small ones come out. And if you take the log of the molecular weight versus the relative migration, it's pretty linear there. So you could actually take this protein right here, and here's a, a standard. And you could compare those and actually get a molecular weight of an unknown protein doing this. Okay, so here's just another example of a protein, or sorry, of a SDS gel. And they've got markers in lanes 1, 2, 10, and 17. And I'm not sure what they're trying to show here, but uh, I just wanted to show this because you can actually see lots of information here. You know, whatever this is has been fairly uh, purified fairly well. Like I said, these are just ladders. So now I can make an approximation of the molecular weight of this protein. So this could be the sample before purification and you know, the product after. The whole point is you can actually get lots of uh, lanes on here. And again, the mobility versus the molecular mass in kilodaltons tends to get, uh, be fairly linear there. Okay, we're almost done. Other than we combine, we can combine our uh, isoelectric focusing with SDS page. 
So as I told you before, we could actually go and find the isoelectric point. So imagine we have a mixture of proteins and we put it here and then we apply the electric field and now it's separated out these proteins into those that have similar isoelectric points. And then what we do is we take this strip and put it at the top of a SDS page gel and we run a uh, electrophoresis. And so this is what's called two-dimensional electrophoresis. So we do some isoelectric focusing and that does one level of separation and then we do the electrophoresis and that does another cell uh, separation. And so in this case here, you can imagine if we took all these dots here and just squished them over to one line, meaning we only did a one dimensional SDS page, it would just essentially just be black along here. And if we just did the isoelectric focusing, all these spots, sorry, all these spots would just appear as a single spot on that strip. And so in isoelectric focusing, they just kind of see a black smear. So if we use both of these, you can actually separate them out and you can see almost individualized proteins here. So what you can do is just take a tissue that has tons of different proteins, do this method, and they do this in uh, proteomics, trying to figure out uh, the type of proteins and the expression of them over time. So let's just say you did an experiment and you collected someone's protein out of their muscle before exercise, and then they did a bunch of exercise and you uh, waited 30 minutes and then you pulled out another muscle sample. And let's say you did the same experiment and all of a sudden this spot is much, much darker. That could give you some indication that exercise increases the expression of whatever that protein is. A very simplified example of information that you can get out of these. Okay, but really the take home thing is you can take a really messy sample and get some very useful information out of there. And so finally, another way to purify besides chromatography is ultracentrifugation. And so what you do is you have a, a gradient here that increases in density of sucrose. And then you have your sample and you're gonna spin this at an incredibly high speed with lots of uh, Gs on those molecules. And what you're gonna find out is these move through here or they sediment at different rates, okay? And so it has to do with uh, the molecule's size and also I believe that their shape has some uh, play into how this moves, but uh, essentially it's the size. And so as you're spinning these around, uh, the heavier ones are going to migrate through this uh, gradient faster because they have more mass. They're experiencing more acceleration due to the, the gravitational, uh, the Gs that it's pulling. And so this uh, set, oh, sorry, I got that backwards, uh, sorry. Yeah, so the fast sedimenting are going to move through their fast tend to be the larger molecules. The slow here are gonna be the lighter molecules. And then what you do is you punch a hole in the bottom here and you collect fractions. And so it's not like column chromatography because you're using uh, a centrifuge and it's movement through this gradient there. And so if you ever wondered about the 50S ribosome or the 16S ribosome that you hear about, that S actually stands for Stedbergs, which is uh, essentially a, a unit of how fast it sediments in a ultra centrifuge. Okay, just a couple more things. So as we talked about, you want the to know the activity of your protein. Just a second, something just happened. Okay, I'll make this quick. I have rambled on too long. Uh, so you wanna know the activity of your protein, but the specific activity de describes the purity of the protein.
related to its concentration. And so that's what's known as the specific activity. Because you could have a very ac active protein, but let's say you have a gram of it. So in reality, it's not doing much work. You just have a lot of the protein. So what you'd like is a very high specific activity, mean, meaning that the protein's very active and you have a very small amount of the protein. Okay. So in summary, uh, we can quantify the purification of, a, well, yeah, we can quantify the purification of a fictitious enzyme here by checking its uh, specific activity. So if we just take a protein and we homogenize it and we start with 15,000 milligrams or 15 grams of protein. So you can see that we actually get some activity in there. So our protein is in there, but it's in with lots of junk. So our specific activity is only 10 uh, units per milligram. So that just means that it could mean two things. Either our protein is not very active or it's very impure. So we get 100% of our protein, but we really haven't done anything yet. So we do a salt fractionation. Uh, we lose some protein. That's expected because there's lots of um, other proteins in there. Notice that the total activity decreases. Again, because in any purification, you're going to lose some of your desired protein. But the specific activity goes up because we got rid of some of our protein, but also a lot of unwanted protein. So now we've got a 92% yield, and uh, I'm not sure what purification level means. Uh, and then we do an ion exchange chromatography. So total protein, gosh, we lost quite a bit of the protein. Uh, we're losing some of our activity. Notice we didn't lose, you know, a whole lot, but our specific activity goes up dramatically three times. Actually, I just figured out what the protein, the purification level is. It's, it's how much more active the specific activity is. That's nine times uh, more active. But notice that we're actually losing the protein each time. In fact, this one here, we take a really big hit in the total amount of protein. Uh, we lose quite a bit of our activity, but again, if we took this activity here divided by the amount of protein that we have, our specific activity goes through the roof. And then we do affinity chromatography, and now we're left with 1.75 milligrams out of 15,000 grams of protein we started with. Notice that we lost some of our total activity, so we lost some of our desired protein but the specific activity jumps up dramatically. And again, the whole goal of this is to try to get the protein as pure as possible. And so that's why they just look at specific activity. If you just rank this by total activity, you're saying, gosh, I'm going in the wrong direction. I'm getting less and less activity. But what you're doing is you're getting more specific activity for that. And so here's just uh, the bottom right is just a, here's some markers, here's the, uninduced cells, meaning that we haven't made it. So it's making more protein than desired. We induce the cells, so now the cell's actually making a lot of the protein. And then what we do is we lyse the cells, and here's all the stuff that's soluble. And then you do a ammonium sulfate precipitation, and you can see, yeah, it looks like we've only got a little bit of other contaminants, do an anion exchange, a cation exchange, and then we take a purified sample. So again, it often takes multiple steps. Wow, thanks for sticking with me. Uh, a lot of information in there, but a lot of different techniques to purify proteins. And that was the goal to introduce you to those. Understand the subtle differences between them and when they may uh, be useful.